Okay, now it's uh, 15 past four. And I want to very welcome you very much to this online seminar, where we're going to have a look at uh, practical tools and methods for clinical decision and process support using the Open EHR standard. And Open EHR sometimes pronounced open air or in different ways, it's the same thing. Uh, and questions during this session are welcome in in the forum where you got the invite and where the information about the entire thing is. And then we'll try to look at that by the end of the session and answer some questions. Uh, and if we don't have time to answer all the questions during the session, we'll try to do that in the written form afterwards. And uh, about half of you are from Sweden. And you can, as you see there on the screen, that openehr.se leads into the Swedish section, section of that forum and you can jump onto the rest. The agenda for today is like this. Uh, you can find the agenda also linked uh, from that other page. And uh, as you can see in the, well, you can't see it on this picture, but if you go there, you can see that we have links also to uh, re resources of different kinds. And we'll start with an introduction and then we'll jump to the green section, which is, which is real examples. So things that have been done with OpenHR or are just about to launch. And then the blue section is about how do you do these things then? What are tools are available? And then we'll wrap up with a, a bit of a roadmap ahead and questions. So we'll go on and leave the world to, word to Ian. Feel free to present yourself. Okay, thanks. <coughs> thanks, Eric. <coughs> Excuse me, Aaron. Um, greetings from the UK. Uh, let me just set up my screen this now. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, I'll just start then. So, um, I'm Ian McNichol, a clinician turned informatician, and uh, it's my job to just give you a very brief introduction to open EHR or open air as, as uh, Eric has already said. Um, this is really just to get everyone up to speed. We appreciate many of you know a bit about this already, but for those who don't, uh, open EHR is an open specification. It's not an open, it's not an open source application as such. It's about specification for a health information model, which is capable of supporting an open platform ecosystem. And the idea is that as far as possible, everything should be vendor neutral and technology neutral, at least in terms of the information. And as we're hearing about today, increasingly the business rules, the guidelines and task planning. It's licensed to allow both open and closed source business models. So you will hear about certainly some open source components, uh, possibly others, also some open source back end services and front end. But you'll also hear about some commercial systems running on top of it. And OpenEHR is quite comfortable with that. In reality, it's a, it's a not for profit, uh, Open Air International is an industry, clinical informatics and health organization uh, collaborative. And fundamentally, this is what we do. You're going to hear quite a lot about some of the specifications and uh, not so much today about the information models, which is the core. And there's a whole bunch of that that is effectively expressed in what you might call normal modeling environments of UML and, and detailed specs. That includes some of the CS, CDSS and task planning things you're going to hear about. But a whole other chunk is, is my world. It's the clinical information model modeling, uh, archetypes, templates, GDLs, some of the task planning models you'll see. These are governed independently and very largely clinically driven. Oop, beg your pardon. Um, we use a bunch of tools to develop these. Um, you'll, again, you'll hear more about these today and see some of them demonstrated. And fundamentally, there is an organization sitting behind this. Uh, it may look a little complicated, but it's working quite well for us at the moment. But most importantly, we're a community. Uh, and you'll hear much more later on and, and through the afternoon that this is a genuine and growing community. And we, it'd be great if, if more of you could join us. And at this point, I'll hand over to Tom Beale, who'll give you a little bit, bit more background on the, the uh, content at hand today, that is the CDSS and task planning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just give me two seconds while I get my uh, projection organized. <clears throat> So I'm just going to give you a very, very short overview in a few minutes of the facilities in open air that 
uh, relate to uh, process and CDS and these kinds of things. So I'm on the Open Air Management Board for anybody who doesn't know me, which is probably a lot of people. Uh, and I mean, CDS, you might need to explain also. Clinical decision support, sorry, that's the standard English uh, contraction for the term clinical decision support, probably reversed or something like that in Swedish. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I've been involved in the open air specifications uh, for 20 years, which is either bad or good, depending on how you look at it, but we're still here. Um, so let me just show you quickly what the uh, key facilities in open air uh, is today relating to CDS and process. So that picture that you see there, that's the, the standard diagram that we use that just helps people orient themselves to the totality of the scope of open air specifications, essentially. It doesn't include clinical models on here, Pictoria, it's the specifications. So <clears throat> the first thing that's been around forever is the ability to represent orders and actions. So just in the standard open air EHR, there are some simple facilities for representing what you would think of as prescriptions or a request for radiology, and also representing the actions that get taken to follow them up, such as giving the drugs, performing the radiology, whatever it might be. So that's sort of for free. The next one that's been around for quite a few years uh, is GDL, which is guideline definition language. And that's been uh, designed and implemented uh, primarily by Cambio and uh, Rong Chen is here uh, this afternoon, so he'll be giving a lot of uh, information about that. And that's kind of classic CDS, classic clinical decision support. Uh, the next one, a little bit more recently in the last about three years, is something called task planning. So that's more plan oriented rather than pure decision support. Uh, in other words, plans for, um, let's say, chemotherapy or following a diabetic patient or um, obstetric care. And you'll hear about some of those things. Underneath, uh, we have, there's of course, as you might imagine, some expression languages and meta models and all kinds of technical stuff. Um, you, you, you won't hear about that today, but it's just to point out that it's there. Of course, open air is not a thing on its own. There's all kinds of things out there in the real world and uh, we try to do our best to investigate them and understand them and use them where we can so that the totality of an open air solution is likely to include pieces of external standards and so on, uh, wrapped or adapted in appropriate ways. Tiny summary of the main challenge, uh, making paper guidelines and other things like order sets, care pathways computable so they can become a direct part of the operational care delivery workplace for professionals. So part of the cognitive field, especially for you people out there listening right now who are clinical people, um, not a piece of paper or a, or a PDF that you read at night and try to memorize, but actually just right in part of uh, your um, tools, um, apps, uh, voice activated, uh, whatever it might be and also for patients. <clears throat> so making stuff that's very well worked out clinically, computable, so it becomes part of the real world of care delivery. So there's a few scenarios. I mentioned the first one already. Um, a major scenario is clinical decision support to enable docs, uh, docs to use guidelines or nurses, any care professional, uh, to use guidelines that are published. So GDL um, covers a lot of those kind of situations. If there was a guideline for, to perform a risk analysis on patients uh, that will find patients matching a certain profile, GDLs um, being used for that, and Ron will talk about that. Things like care pathways, um, tracking patients, plan-based care, uh, administration of things like chemotherapy that have a, a sort of complicated, well, not a complicated, but a plan, a multi-step plan, multi-days and so on. Uh, and also complex and team-based uh, things. Uh, we've been working on task planning uh, to cover some of those areas. So just as a reminder, the complexity of this whole area, that's just one piece out of a 20 page guideline. And even uh, if you're a clinical person, you'll recognize that 20 times that information that you see on the screen now, uh, no matter how good you are, 
you probably just won't remember it all. And of course, it's always changing depending on what the latest uh, science says. So maybe it says uh, less than six hours ago right now, and it might be that number might change later on. So humans need help. So our basic facilities, GDL I already mentioned, um, don't worry about the complexity of that diagram, but essentially it's rule-based when then rules, when certain things are true in the patient data or uh, from other data sources, then do certain things. That's, that's the basic idea of when then rules. It connects to the EHR. Uh, you can re generate um, reporting and uh, recommendations. And one of the ways of doing that is something called CDS hooks, which uh, Ron will talk about. The other facility that I mentioned is task planning. And it's, like I said, more of a task uh, um, based concept. So it's a bit more like BPMNN, BPMN. Those boxes are tasks. And uh, that's just a, a piece of task planning. And you'll see quite a lot of examples of that. And the resources for the technically minded uh, and the engineers out there, you can just go to specifications.openair.org and you'll see the process and CDS parts of uh, that specifications website and you can download the main specs I've just mentioned. So that's my little introduction of uh, where, what our open air facilities are. Eric? Great, we'll jump over to Ron. We'll present a little bit more. Yes, I can grab the screen. Okay, um, so before I, you know, before we go forward to demos and uh, explaining how CDS work, I would like to take a step, uh, you know, back to look at uh, the bigger picture. Uh, I'm also, uh, my name is Ron, uh, like Ian, I'm also a clinician turned informatician. Uh, been implementing open air for almost 15 years now, uh, contributing to specification and, and design and so on. But for the last seven, eight years, my main job has been uh, working with district support applications. Um, so this picture, actually this picture is not new. It has been around, I believe, in the beginning of 90s, for even late 80s. Uh, actually I actually used it in my PhD work. Uh, you might need to zoom in a little bit. We see the Okay, so probably share the wrong screen. If that's the, I need to find Zoom. Stop sharing and uh, share. That's the one. Is it better? Perfect. Okay, good. Uh, so this idea is uh, is not new actually. It's from late 80s, beginning of 90s, one electronic health record system has been introduced into uh, practice. Um, so then people look at this and say, okay, introduce lots of, you know, bring lots of potentials. Uh, if you look at me clinical medicine as a, as a vertical industry, you have lots of people doing research. They discover new knowledge, they find updates of existing knowledge and so on. Lots of studies and they publish lots of papers, uh, typically through scientific conferences, peer reviewed journals, and those gradually and slowly uh, combine, aggregate into national guidelines, protocols, and so on. And normally when I ask students, how long does it take uh, for, for this evidence-based knowledge to reach the majority of the practitioner? Uh, people are surprised to know it takes 17 years. Uh, and it really takes years for these things to become uh, used. Uh, so we really want to overcome that uh, barrier, this 17 years uh, delay. But then there's a larger problem in the practice uh, when, when clinicians uh, meet patients at point of care. There's uh, something so-called cognitive limitation, cognitive uh, barrier. As um, average human being, uh, the, the psychologist, um, the social scientist discover, we can only hold seven or sometimes even four uh, pieces of information in the, in the knowledge processing in decision-making session. And that's a real problem in clinical medicine because you need to deal with, you know, list of medication, side effects, the complaints. So it's way beyond uh, the capacity of uh, normal human being uh, in processing, information processing. And we can easily get distracted. And there are all sorts of spices in decision making. So in order to overcome that, 
there has been lots of work actually in tissue support systems. So this particular area called CDS or CDSS is not new. It has been around. There have been lots of work. Um, and, and that's the part of the reason lots of uh, clinician turned informatician can drawn into this area. But sadly, CDS system are not widely used today. There are lots of barriers. Uh, probably one of the reasons is because of uh, lack of standards, lack of interoperability. Um, but gradually, you know, as, I, as we do more of the distinct support system, uh, we also realize there's a uh, there's scalability issue. You know, if you only do one particular distinct support system for one um, particular case, one particular uh, region or one particular hospital, it will never be scalable. Um, so, the, so part of the challenge is also to design and to build a system that is scalable and use reusable components. Uh, and that's why it's so convincing to use uh, standards like from OpenEHR with the uh, language neutral, with models that independent of uh, terminology systems and so on. Uh, I have another slide to, dis to, to describe the informatics thinking. And then the third challenge is, is actually utilize data generated from practice, you know, could be deviation, could be uh, treatment outcomes and to discover new uh, insights, new updates, and so on. And then it has to continue. This is a cyclic uh, iteration of knowledge information. And that's this, uh, you know, two uh, arrows in, in the middle. It's about information and about knowledge. And the goal really here as uh, for us, for everyone here, is to shorten uh, the cycles, you know, the, the, the loop in order to do more, but with less uh, investment. So the next slide. So how to actually to get there, you know, to to design and to implement this support system in a scalable way and to use as much as building blocks as, as you go. And this paper from Alan Rector's group uh, from Manchester University give us uh, some insight. Um, actually, there's a series of publication uh, around these ideas. This particular one is from 2001. Uh, so like all great ideas, they are really simple to, to explain. So if you look at the uh, kinds of models we, we're facing in health informatics, uh, so this gave you these three kind of principal models. On top of the diagram, you have so-called information model. And these days we may maybe call them more like EHR models, uh, like open EHR archetypes, even H O seven five resource and so on. So those are approximation to uh, the information you know, about individual patients, about individual care plans, family histories, and so on. Uh, so another way to think about this is that how how to query a system, how to get information about uh, certain conditions. So this is about the instance. It's about uh, patients. Then you have second kind of model uh, on the right uh, bottom, it's, it's about concept model. Sometimes people call these things terminology systems. So in this corner, you have system like uh, ICD-10, ICD-11, ATC, LOINC, uh, and more gradually, SNOMED CT with sound uh, ontology basis. So these things describe, we, sometimes we call them uh, slow moving background knowledge. So people for, like me spend six years in uh, medical school, we pick up some lots of background knowledge and they kind of evolving, but they're evolving very slowly, like anatomy, uh, disease class classification, uh, you know, all this slow moving. And there are also increasing uh, lots of collaboration, international collaboration around this space. Uh, so that's fine. That's lots of standardization happening there. The, the more, more problematic area is actually on the right hand side, uh, so-called inference model. Uh, sometimes we also call these things uh, foreground knowledge. Uh, for instance, uh, how to treat heart, heart failure patients uh, in 2020. I mean, because these things moving very fast uh, in ca cardiology, oncology, and so on. They lay, you know, the, the guidelines tend to be updated maybe once or twice a year. Um, and, and this and is what, what you're going to show now, right? Exactly. And just explain that we're shifting now from the introduction to the next part, which is demos of different kinds. And it's exactly. wrong, wrong doing the next part also. So we're into the green yeah. part now. So does the screen sharing working still? Uh, yes, we, okay. see, we see the 
the which screen right. are you seeing oh the sh yeah okay so now what what i'm going to do is uh, demonstrating some of the applications we have been developing uh, in, in in our journey essentially using gdl and some of the standardized uh, models uh, the first one i'm going to show uh, is a video demo um, to show the full flavor of a one distinct support system that working as embedded inside the EHR system. So this is Cosmic, uh, for some of you probably know. Uh, this is uh, when, when the patient is loaded, patient's health record is loaded in Cosmic, uh, then there's a pop-up uh, you know, from the CDS alert that shows this patient has AF, uh, atrial, fibrillation, atrial fibrillation consideration. And uh, because of the patient, uh, because the patient has not been given the right treatment, the alert uh, prompts the clinician to take a, a look of the stroke prevention treatment. Uh, so here, actually the user choose to click on this alert, but the user can also choose to ignore the alert and then work with that uh, in a later stage. So there are many things happening at the same time. So the two things now, there's alert, then there's uh, sometimes we call single screen application. Uh, sometimes it's okay, you know, with a simple use case, you can deal with uh, a simple alert, you know, grab the attention of the user and then remind certain things. But in this case, it's more about, it's, it's more a serious uh, treatment review. You really need to give a chance for the patient, to, for the doctor to review what's going on with this patient in, in the case of stroke prevention. Um, for those who are not uh, clinical or familiar with AF uh, induced stroke, um, in, in average, uh, AF condition induce about 30% or 25% of strokes. Those strokes induced by AF are more subtle, uh, more fatal compared to strokes uh, caused by other conditions. So this is very much about estimating the risk uh, of stroke in this AF patient and remind user uh, to give the prop, you know, uh, appropriate treatment, in this uh, case, uh, anticoagulation treatment. So in this single screen application, as you can see, it's fully embedded inside the, the main EHR system in some of the Swedish regions. Uh, and then uh, in the application, we pre-fill information from this uh, health record, from this patient health record regarding his previous conditions like AF, congestive heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. And we ought to calculate uh, this score, so-called charts VASC, um, as approximation to estimate the, the coming year stroke risk for this patient. And based on that, we also tell um, if the patient, to, to check if the patient has been given the right treatment, if the risk is uh, considered to be high. Um, and later on in the demo, you can see we actually uh, allow the user to choose to deviate or follow the recommendation. If the clinician choose to deviate from the recommendation from the CDS, there's a chance for them to say, uh, I'm deviating because for what reason? Uh, and that deviation reason is synchronized with the national registry for the AF. So after sign button is pressed, the CDS app will generate a full-fledged medical record note in the main health record inside the system. Um, so often we, what we do is not about just alerting the, the doctor, just provide the recommendation. It's also about uh, approximate, you know, uh, optimization of the process, automate small tasks, small menu tasks, make uh, the work easier uh, to carry out. So that is the stroke prevention. That's one of the first app we put in the market. I think it's around 2016. The work of course started uh, earlier than that. 2016, this, this was put in production uh, with the Swedish, Swedish regions and this is still in production today. Um, there was a randomized study, uh, 12 months randomized study designed to measure the effects of this CDS and it proven, uh, the study result was that it proved that uh, this CDS can increase adherence of uh, stroke prevention treatment in patients with AF. So it was a, a very good uh, story. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to, um, I'm going to talk, you know, I think it's maybe good to explain how, how we work in Cambio CDS. Uh, our, our strategy is to not to just solve individual 
clinical uh, decision support cases. Our main business goal is, is to build a platform, build the toolboxes, allow others to use the building blocks, use informatics, informatics methods to develop and rapidly deploy these applications. Uh, so for this session, I will talk about this uh, production ready applications, but in the next session, I will talk about the tools. And the second one I'm going to talk about is um, uh, some of you probably heard of uh, SVF cancer process in Sweden. Um, so this one is uh, about SVF process. This particular one is a collaboration with the uh, RCC um, Regional Oncology Center in uh, Stockholm um, and uh, a collaboration with uh, CGM Take Care. So they are the primary EHR system in Stockholm region. And we managed to have a collaboration with them in 2018 and uh, having this embedded inside uh, the, the main EHR system in as take care. So I'm going to full size this. Uh, so this is, uh, so for you that's familiar with SVF, it's a standardized care process to manage oncology patients. And there are about uh, 30 of them now standardized in Sweden. This is just one of them. And this is one uh, a small part of that process. So this particular one is about uh, finding suspected prostate cancer patient uh, for, the, for the primary care doctors and help them to write a, a quality referral so they can send this through to the specialist in the region. Um, so the design is very much about checklist. It's about automation. And uh, I would say probably less decision support here, more process optimization. So on the, and this user interface is Swedish now. Um, so on the left most side, uh, you have a small list. You know, here we say the patient is 70 years old. And uh, according to the national standard, there's a small checklist you have to go through. Already, already now, uh, by detecting the PSA value in the local, you know, in integrated clinical system, we can see this PSA value is way too high for that age group. So it's flagged as, uh, as red. And anyhow, we, we ask the primary care doctors to go through this checklist. If the patient has urination problem, if there's any uh, family history for prostate cancer, and if there's a growing, increasing uh, bony pain, uh, you know, it's a bad sign. And then if there's a positive uh, palpation of uh, uh, normally finding, if it's yes, we ask uh, the lateral, you know, left or right. So you probably notice already, when I'm doing this data entry uh, as guided by this application, the text is auto-generated by, you know, lifting the, the input. If I say left, this will change here, you know, this text will be taken there. And also we, aggregate a list of relevant medication for this referral to the specialist, to urolo urologist in the region. Um, and as soon as you have done this part, uh, the data entry part, uh, this is the result, you know, a clear recommendation from CDS. If this patient is suspected of prostate cancer, in this case, it is, uh, it is well suspected uh, prostate cancer in this case. What's left to do? So it's a, again, small checklist, not everything that we can do in the app. For instance, uh, the doctor is recommended to print out a, bro uh, a brochure for this patient and then do certain things. Then uh, fill in a few more information. You know, we, as much as we can pre-fill, there are things that we can't do today. So for instance, the social situation, uh, the user has to say good or bad, maybe previous conditions. You know, if it's well-defined, we can always try to aggregate use uh, using rules and so on. Uh, so I'm going to just fill this out. Good, social, uh, other situation, and then the telephone numbers and so on. So once this is done, you can see the button is uh, enabled. So by this clicking, by clicking this button, our integration API will send full-fledged referral request through the, the underlying clinical system and to the specialist. And the next one I'm going to show you is uh, another decision support system we're going to launch this year. It was actually delivered in 2018. Uh, it took a while to, for this to be uh, de deployed and used in 
actually, I'm going to use the other one to show this. So I'm going to use show the Swedish version. Uh, sorry, can you see my screen still? Yes. yes. The pressure ulcer. Yes. OK, perfect. Um, OK, so this is a, a, a nursing staff facing uh, decision support slash process support application. It's loosely based. I think it's actually based on senior alert quality registry in Sweden. Uh, quality registry uh, senior alert is uh, designed to support uh, geriatric care in patients, uh, elderly patients with pressure ulcer, for risk, malnutrition, oral health, and a number of other areas. So far, we have built four um, applications for, for, for this uh, area. So this is particular one is about pressure ulcer. Uh, sorry, again, this is in Swedish. Uh, it has well-defined uh, categories, what kind of pressure ulcer uh, the user is dealing with, and they use international uh, instrument called the modified Norton scale. And that's actually the case for any of the areas we work in, the, in this area. It's quite common to find an international model that we can reuse. And um, when I show you how we, we do these things, it's actually based on archetypes, based on the GDO guidelines as a building block. So as on this user interface, you know, it's, it's designed to work with a touchable screen mobile device. The nurse will say, okay, in the admission process, she will just document the, the nurse, uh, the, the, the pressure ulcer uh, categories. Um, and that will be transferred to the journal notes when this uh, admission is done. And quickly, uh, just check through the, the risk uh, assessment score uh, called uh, no modified Norton scale. So as soon as it, that is done, uh, there's a score. Uh, maybe it, the, this is not uh, good for demo, it's, it's the low risk, so I need to reverse this. Now you see this is uh, below the threshold. Uh, so we, so part of that is about assessment of the patient, uh, the pressure also in front of you. But the other part is about uh, discovering the, the risk and how to manage the pressure ulcer, the existing pressure ulcer and so on. So here, uh, this is an individualized care plan uh, based on the national guideline, but can be further personalized for this particular patient. So here the nurse will set a goal, uh, either it's, uh, preventing any pressure ulcer, or maybe prevent a new pressure ulcer, or maybe uh, you know further worsening of pressure ulcer. And they can also set specific things like uh, you know improve the body position in the chair and the bed maybe uh, increasing screen, skin care, and they can even put some notes around skin care and so on. So it's a lot about uh, personalization, you know, uh, of, of care plan, specific care plan for this patient based on the care needs. And it's about, uh, you know, more about process support because it's about following the protocols, actually have this care plan for the downstream care uh, activities. So when, once this is done, uh, the nurse can save the risk score in the journal system. Uh, she can also create a care plan and then follow the, the kind of checklist uh, for different shifts and so on. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the number of this kind of single screen application we have built for the, for the caregivers. Uh, this will go live with uh, a <coughs> land soon uh, this month. Yeah, is there anything you want to wrap up with? We need to go on to the next very soon. Yeah, so maybe another one uh, from overseas. From, uh, I mean, there are lots of links in the agenda, so please feel free to follow them and uh, ask questions and so on. Maybe just quickly show the type 2 diabetes prescribing. I think that's quite uh, a different case. Uh, um, if it can be done in a minute or two. Yeah, so just quickly show the user interface, you know, it's uh, Where is it now? Yeah, it's here. So this is uh, integrated with a GP system called XMO uh, in Denmark uh, for the region for the primary care doctors in the region south. Uh, so it's fully embedded and we get the lab test, we get medication list, treatment priorities from the from the, the clinician from the GP system. And uh, then we support based on a, a pretty, quite a big uh, decision table, uh, what kind of appropriate medication in this particular case for this patient, treatment targets and uh, lab tests and treatment uh, priorities. 
And the actual tree is quite complex. So we use this unit table to drive the behavior of this kind of application. So this particular case is about manage glucose. Then we have another tab of managing uh, blood pressure. Uh, we have come across quite many examples like this, you know, in glucose management in type 2 diabetes, but also patients with heart failure, uh, kidney failures, and so on. I mean, with this kind of complexity, it's really, um, uh, for me, it's kind of pressing, you know, to, to make uh, this kind of contribution so we can actually build safety net for clinicians. So maybe I stop now uh, for my demo session, then I, I will try to explain a little bit more uh, what's happening under the hood. Yeah, later. Yes, and we'll switch over still in Scandinavia to Bjorn Ness from DIPS in Norway. Yes, thank you. I'll just continue on, on there. I will actually have my colleague uh, Morten to do some uh, demonstrations, so he'll just uh, drop in now. So we, we wanted to give, uh, so this is all about uh, OpenEHR, so we wanted to give a demonstration about how we use OpenEHR to provide uh, decision support, process support in our running EHR which we call the DIPS Arena. So we will give a short demonstration about the acute ward uh, for triage based on vital signs, and also uh, give a short demonstration about the new COVID-19 application we have developed, which we'll come back to later. So go on, Morten, you have a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Well, uh, now we're inside uh, uh, DIPS Arena, which is the newest uh, version of Arena, 19.1.2. Uh, and this is a patient called Andersen. Uh, and we are now inside uh, the acute care uh, module, uh, which has been, it's not in production yet, but we hope it will be soon. Uh, it's all based around uh, one form, basically, one large form, uh, which is based on OpenEHR, which uh, looks a lot like this. And it, it's uh, thought being used in the uh, acute ward. And here you have, for the ones who don't understand Norwegian, this is pulse oximetry. This is the heart frequency, blood pressure, body temperature, uh, respiration frequency, and the Glasgow Coma Scale for assessing uh, confusion or not. So uh, if you get a patient inside the ER, uh, the nurse usually do a triage. And now I will be presented to be the nurse and I will have some uh, quite bad values just to trigger everything. So this person has a very, uh, has low saturation uh, and he has a high pulse and a systolic blood pressure, pressure. And as we see here on the right side of the screen, you can see deviations in the new score. The new score is an early, early, early warning score, which they use a lot in Norway. And it's now actually going to be upgraded into the news two, which is a new version of the new score, which takes into account more uh, the chronic obstructive patients taking more, yeah. yeah. Uh, we here also have the body temperature, and this patient has a fever of a 41, and he has a fast respiratory rate, and he is not totally with us. And what happens now is that within the, within the uh, uh, form now, we have calculated, calculated the news form for the nurse. We have calculated the Q sofa, which is a, a score for finding if a patient is going into septicemia. Uh, and here we have the calculation for the GCS score. What we have under here is that we have the deviations so that the nurse can evaluate the deviations themselves also. And here is a recommended triage for the patient. And now this has been set to red, but we'll set it to orange because it's uh, the nurse who will be the end uh, definition of what the patient is to, uh, by looking at the clinical picture overall. Uh, down here, we have a so suggested response to the news and to the queue sofa and to the sit set. Uh, these ones just say that you should call the doctor because it's their responsibility to uh, order the broad blood samples and to see if the patient actually has a septicemia or not. And the news share only tells you that you should call the doctor also to get a second opinion to what to do with the patient, if it should be moved to the, moved to the intensive care, for example, or not. On the bottom left here, we have a specialized decision support. Uh, and this one is uh, SUP, it's uh, Community Acquired Pneumonia, I think in English. Uh, when you press that, you get another uh, field here that you have to 
say something in. And what we say is that this patient actually has a newly acquired confusion. Uh, and when we hit that, you will get a new score here, a CRB65, which is an easier version of a CURB65 score. Uh, and what this does is that this actually tells if the patient uh, how serious uh, possible pneumonia is in the patient and comes up with the treatment suggestion from the Norwegian antibiotics uh, recommendations. Uh, when I as a nurse approve this form, uh, I'm on a cell phone, but I think that's, yeah. Uh, all the results will spread around in the system. So here we have all the measurements uh, single-handedly from the form. And we can also uh, follow up the patient by doing a single pulse or a single respiration. Uh, and you see all the dots here, like in a re regular um, uh, paper journal, actually. Uh, and what's combined with this is that you have a patient list which looks a bit like uh, this. Uh, and here you can have a overview of all the patients in the ER department. Here we have a few values. And then all everything we filled in in the last form will be moved into here and trigger different warnings. For example, here you see a patient who had the yellow triage and he should have been seen for a lot of minutes ago because this is all test data. Uh, and this is all, will also trigger if you, for example, fill in a new uh, pulse somewhere in the system that deviates too much from the latest news, you will get a uh, warning like this, that due to a, a abnormal change in the possible news, you should do a completely whole news. Uh, Anything I forgot now, Bjorn? Oh, yep. I think it's uh, it's great. We only have a few minutes. Yep. So this is yes. just to give an idea yep. about yep. how to use OpenEHR for such applications. Yep. So just a few minutes, very short yep. on the COVID-19. Very short on the COVID-19. Okay, this is, uh, it's based on three forms. This one actually, it's a screening form, a status form, and a tracking form for, and uh, four forms, and the procedure form. In the screening form, we have a possibility now to fill in what symptoms the patient may have, and you can detail it further by saying when when did the patient get the symptoms, for example, 14, 14 days, Tager Siden, this is a Norwegian, <laughs> yeah, and then approve this, uh, and then you will have that you have done the screening, but the patient is a suspect in COVID-19 because of the symptoms, and that's what the recommendations in Norway, Norway now is, that you test everybody who has a symptom within the hospital. And then here, you can go further and say that the, it's a confirmed case after testing. It's a still, it's a, it was a negative test, but you still want to suspect the patient and treat him as a suspect, or that you as a, a clinician says that this is not a COVID-19. And then if we do this, say that the patient is confirmed, then we can fill in, start fill in the uh, contact tracing. Uh, which is an overlying here, context trace, saying that if it's uh, begun or completed, you have uh, told someone else to do it. Uh, but for the example here, we can do this. And then you can fill in uh, up to 100 contacts in each of these. So this is contacts between the hospital staff. And this one is contacts outside of the hospital. So then the people who are doing the contact tracing can use this form to continually fill in when they find new contacts. Uh, and they can also say here that if the, the contact themselves have been traced or not, and you get a counter on top saying how many you are done with and how many you are not done with. This is, uh... <laughs> Very nice. nice uh, Martin, Two applications uh, in record-breaking time from the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll come back a, uh, a few words about uh, COVID-19 later. And we just uh, demonstrated it to give an, uh, kind of an idea about how we can uh, support the, the processes uh, at the ward uh, using OpenEHR data uh, and, uh, and OpenEHR acquiring. Uh, so thank yes. you. And now we'll thank be swimming over the Atlantic down to Brazil and have a presentation there from Danielle. So I'm here, yeah. Let me, um, one minute to share my screen. 
And I forgot to say in the beginning that this is not a slick uh, sales presentation, as you might have seen, but uh, we understand that people that have registered for this are interested in real things also, uh, and not just PowerPoints. So bear with us that we're actually showing real stuff that may take some time. But we have some PowerPoints too, as you've noticed. Okay, let me try to share here. And then you're doing a PhD on this process uh, and guidelines regarding maternity care, if I understand things correctly. Yeah, I'm having some problems here. I don't know what's going on. We could switch around and do the COVID stuff with Ian if you're ready and yeah. then come back okay. to you. Okay, uh, yeah. So are you ready for that, Ian McNichol? To talk about the I COVID? I second, get my video on. Uh, try to do my screen share. Ignore my beautiful new 16 chin, 16 chin inch MacBook that's sitting beside me. It's just arrived. I hope you're all jealous. Okay, um, yeah, so this kind of, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Bjorn at the end of my little bit here, um, because he really was the instigator of this work. But something like three weeks ago, um, obviously, as COVID-19 was really starting to kick off, he called me on a Friday afternoon and said, look, we think we're going to have to do something within the DIPS environment, the, the hospital settings, um, but we feel it's something that we should share internationally. Uh, and this was primarily around um, screening, pre-hospital screening of patients coming in either to inpatients or outpatients. And I was aware that there was some similar work starting to kick off in the UK, particularly around community self-screening. So I agreed. We decided to keep this reasonably private for a few days because we really weren't sure if this was a, a good use case. And it gave Bjorn and myself a chance to speak to colleagues and figure out whether this was something that was worth doing. Uh, we did that. Uh, Bjorn got that feedback and he'll tell you more about that in, in a moment. Um, and after another few days, uh, getting some other uh, vendors involved uh, and other colleagues involved, we decided to go public on it. We started with Project Kofefe um, and moved on uh, and kept that private. Then we then opened up this discourse channel. So if you want to see the story of how we just got involved with it, we, we kept that discourse channel private and then opened it up. Um, and moved it on to this open air COVID-19 project, which is the live one. Um, you'll see it's pretty stream of consciousness stuff. Um, you know, we were working very quickly. We were working collaboratively and we're working quite often at 3 a.m. Uh, so if it all seems a bit random and things are a little messy, uh, then that's because it was random and messy. But we think we've achieved quite a lot. Um, so we now have uh, a series of different open air templates and apps built on top of them. And if I can just try and run, try and run through them uh, fairly quickly. Top left, we've got the original uh, uh, templates. There were two of them. Uh, one was about this idea of suspected assessment and the other was about uh, reporting back to WHO in particular, uh, the, you know, in someone who had a, a proven COVID-19 infection. Uh, and that was intended to be pretty quick pretty dirty, uh, very close to people who were deploying applications. But we recognized we also needed to do something a little bit more deliberative. Um, the phrase samurai and ninja will come back again. Um, so top left is a ninja. Next, the next one on the left is a samurai. So that's primarily the CKM authors, uh, so Yabaka and uh, Heather Leslie are reading that. So there's a little bit of duplication here, but it's deliberate. Uh, it's, it's to try and mop up and make the models better as we go along. But of course, it's hard to do all of this internationally. The, the, the use case has changed, the disease itself is changing, the responses of the clinical community are changing. So I think not surprisingly, we are seeing some national initi initiatives as well. Uh, top right uh, is work that I'm involved with in Scotland. We're certainly using the suspected uh, risk assessments, but this is another that we've been asked to get involved with um, around what we call anticipatory care plan, which is people's end of life care plans. Sadly, that is going to become an important factor uh, for many of us um, that has to be addressed. Uh, uh, bottom right uh, is work that's happening in Norway and so you back I believe is leading the international the, the national modeling being done for again similar sorts of uh, areas but as far as possible we're all using the same archetypes. 
And just as an example, to see how quickly we can adapt, and I think that hopefully this is the message, we can move very fast in open air because we are using existing models, but because the tooling allows, allows us to model new kinds of data information very quickly. Um, the screenshot at the bottom uh, literally was uh, an archetype that I built yesterday on the basis of a PDF sent through by an anaesthetist and is now being, I believe, worked up into a hospital application in Portugal. But models, is, there's no point building models if, if no one uses them. So just here's a, a bunch of uh, screenshots um, of some apps that have been built and are running live um, in, uh, in various hospitals. The ones here particularly are in Taunton uh, and are, we're making use of the better CDR and their form building tools. The, the two in the left are the ones that were built according to those uh, initial uh, templates I've talked about. The other two in the right are built by the people in Taunton themselves. So this is the NHS people themselves have built some others. The one you can see critical care pre-referral information and the other is for a summary of, of patients who are re receiving COVID, uh, COVID treatment uh, in, in ICU. But a whole bunch of others. Uh, that's a, what's called an S-bar for, this is for paramedics. Now I'm modeling that in Scotland. Uh, there's an open source uh, screening project. Pasiensky there's a Norwegian uh, GP system company. They've also used the screening template and built it into their application for uh, patients. And bottom right is we've got some students involved from University College London who are helping us do uh, rapid form building, mostly for prototyping. And, and uh, so they're using they're using open air at the back and back of that. And I think possibly finally the most interesting one, and we've literally just got hold of this, um, is we have a very active open air community in China. And understandably, they've been in, in the thick of this and have just shared uh, a whole bunch of artifacts uh, and uh, a really interesting site. Again, this is, uh, you'll see that on the discourse forum uh, under the COVID-19 category. Uh, don't have time to go through it, but fundamentally, they've built archetypes, they've built templates, and they've built GDL2 artifacts. And I only just failed to get a screenshot before we went live with this, but definitely have a look at that. It is based on their real experience, uh, in particular, how to manage uh, quite ill patients. Uh, and I think we may well come back and rely on this quite heavily. So, as I said before, I'm really pleased that the way that this community has come together, um, not just uh, clinicians, but people within vendor companies working to fix issues, working cross tooling. Um, it's been really heartening to see it happen. And I'll pass over then to uh, Bjorn. Yes, uh, thank you, Ian. I will share my screen. So, uh, so um, the, the story I'm telling now uh, is, uh, it's about DIPS and what we did in Norway, but uh, th this is not the important message here because th this process has, uh, has actually been uh, open HR in a nutshell. In, within a few weeks, we have kind of um, uh, shown uh, what we can do with uh, such an international community working in, um, in, a, in a very uh, specific uh, period. So, uh, uh, so as uh, Ian said, uh, for us, it kind of started uh, on uh, the end of February. We got this idea, can we do something, as Ian said, and, and talked to, to Ian that, that Friday. And uh, the week after, we had some demonstration talking with uh, two of our uh, hospitals uh, close to, close to the, the office. And uh, we found later that, well, we can, we, we should do something on this and uh, DIPS, uh, we, we choose to, to implement the application and try to deliver to the customers. And then this, uh, this, this weekend, the 6th to 8th of March, where all the open HR community came together, uh, it was uh, Ian, it was better, it was um, uh, all, all, all kind of people involved making these, uh, these models, uh, it, was, uh, it was really a great uh, effort. And for us, it's, uh, as you said, Ian, something about the samurai and the ninja. So what we did was actually to pick up on the models that uh, you, you in the Open HR community have been building for years and which we had approved also in, in Norway. So there were good models there already present which we could uh, take into the COVID-19 application and, uh, and do some justification on them. So that was the Ninja part where we did some, some things to actually speed up the process and make these models inter international. 
Uh, but for us, it was really important to have this base of the approved international models, also uh, approved in Norway, because uh, in the beginning of the situation, it was only an, an outbreak and it was is later turned into some pandemic situation. And we kind of changed the, uh, the shift from uh, contact tracing into more the follow up on, on the word uh, page, uh, on the word side. But the models based on uh, years of experience actually uh, still work. So we didn't have to change anything in the application to adapt to the new, need, new needs. Um, Okay, yeah. <laughs> and um, so the situation in, in Norway right now is that uh, actually most of the country uh, have started to, to use the application. Uh, on, during the meeting, a few uh, um, customers' hospitals in the southeastern part of Norway uh, said they wanted to use the application. And um, in Norway, we have a word called the Dugnad, where the community does it, uh, does it share. So DIPS, we are providing this uh, uh, free of charge as part, part of the Dugnad to follow up on the uh, uh, COVID-19 um, process. In the, uh, in the right corner there, you have this about hundreds of healthcare personals. That's actually the, the biggest issue for our customers. And it's about how to set up uh, the hospitals now to, uh, to meet a possible big wave of uh, patients. We have to be simple on the routines. So we have to make really simple application. We cannot change the, the workflow and how they use the systems. So that's actually the biggest part of the, uh, in, you know, the, the process here is to adapt the solution into how they work locally to actually uh, follow up on the, uh, on the, on the needs. What we did uh, during this phase uh, was, this is also shared on uh, this course, uh, was to try to build a model about uh, what was the use case we had to support. I want Seems like we lost um, in the situation was, it's, it's hard to get um, in contact. You lost me. Just for a few seconds. Am I back? We were, yes. Yeah, so my internet connection was unstable. So, uh, but the point here is that it was hard to get uh, contact with, you know, the healthcare providers, with uh, relevant uh, clinical people in this situation. They were all too busy preparing for the uh, epidemic situation. And to work then in this international community was really important because then we could always have some, some, somebody to challenge on the ideas about how to uh, develop the application. And as uh, I will be short here, because uh, Morten demonstrated this, we created this kind of application to follow up the patient on the ward. And we made these uh, screens with uh, the form solution, uh, the form designer, the same uh, uh, designer thing that uh, the better guys also use. So it's, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, and what's really important is that in, within our company, we have two different applications depending on the, the customer. So we, this is the proprietary kind of data model, but it was built on the same clinical models that we developed with the OpenHR community. And it was really great to see that our models could be used also for this proprietary work. And uh, what we are working on right now is to see how can we then use the OpenHR data to provide some insight in the situation. This is only for the test, test uh, data. But based on the OpenHR backend doing AQL queries, uh, how can we then see the, the evolvement of the, of the disease? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we've seen some things that can actually be done with OpenHR and have been done and are being deployed soon. And some have been working for several years. Uh, now we're gonna switch over to Dane, if you're ready. Danielle? Rick, uh, I'm going to project because she's not sure she's yeah. got her AV and she's just going to talk, so I'll... Yeah. I understood that the internet is pretty busy, busy in Brazil right now. Yeah. Maybe that. Uh, just give me two seconds and... Have we got that projected yeah. correctly? Yes. Good. Yeah, it's showing. Okay, Danny, I'll, I'll just quickly introduce her. Is Danny, Danielle Santos-Alves. She's a midwife. She's an uh, obstetric nurse 
and she's a PhD candidate at the Federal University of Pernambuco working on uh, uh, process um, support for the obstetric process. I think uh, we can hear her, so she can do the voice if she wants to. Yeah, I, I can. Go for it. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, Thomas, can you please next um, slide, please? So as Thomas said, um, this is our team that we work with this um, perinatal care task planning. Um, it's part of my doctoral thesis um, from the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. And this is me, uh, I'm a midwife and nurse midwife and also a professor in the Federal University in Pernambuco, Brazil, and also a PhD student. Um, today I want to show you um, a little bit of my research that um, we um, started doing the definition of a model based on open air standard to represent the perinatal care process and clinical data for uh, uncomplicated pregnancy. So our first problem was that currently we have a lot of guidelines that it's paper-based or sometimes you can see in a browser as the NICE, for example, from the NHS. But uh, most of the time you can see these um, guidelines uh, separately with little or no connections between the workflow and the data for each stage, especially in the pregnancy. And none of the current guidelines are computable form, so they are not implemented in a tool or in a system. And basically now we um, have no, um, however, none of were designed to um, healthcare process. And we started modeling with um, BPMN and we have another notifications. So our motivation in this research Uh, was to, first of all, we got the Brazilian um, guideline from the um, Minister of Health and also NICE and the World Health Organization guidelines and we um, reviewed them and we started to do, we think, to do a um, specification to, to join these guidelines in a, in a computable way. And in a clinical, our clinical motivation is to share these um, guidelines with the patient and also with the health professional to enable the plan compliance and early detection of the problems. So the solution that we found, first of all, was to use the BPNN, but a little bit forward, we, now we are using the task planning open air test planning. And then we can use archetypes and templates. And also can, we can describe uh, automated support model for clinical process. And then we can have multiple performers, nested um, test plans, conditional branching time settings and so on. Just to start um, our strategy, we had We've done a validation with um, some professionals. Um, we've done a validation with nine, um, 18 uh, health professionals, eight non-specialists and 10 specialists. And we define a data set, um, uh, 508 clinical data points validated. And then we check the CKM uh, and we got 82 archetypes reviewed, and now we are building 18 templates. And then we also validate um, the workflow in BPMN, first of all, for uh, antenatal care consultation, antenatal risk assessment, labor, birth, and postpartum. And here we have our case study. Before we got the BPMN process, 
As you can see here, our overview, it's a gigantic workflow, and we have the first consultation and the standard consultation. And we can zoom it a little bit, and you can see the complexity of just the first consultation with uh, a description of each week of um, the gestational week. And after that, we had a challenge to um, transcribe this to open air um, test planning. And we started doing this. So we can zoom the first consultation. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, when, you, when we are using the test planning, open air test planning, we have uh, the work plan, the full work plan in the top of the, the, the screen. And then we have a label, a gold label, talking about each task. And each task you can attribute to um, different users that we will do each um, task plan. And as you can see, we have here, recitation and the antenatal care first consultation and you open the appointment and you start the consultation with um, the history of the, the pregnant woman and check all those tasks um, in parallel. We calculate the gestational age and then we go through the um, standard consultation. It's a little bit slow, but, and here we have the standard consultation. As you can see, it's a, a complexity. We start with this label and the, the function attributed to a nurse or, or a GP or doctor, anyone. And then we have a lot of um, tasks to do. And as you can see, each task can be a separate task or a sub process. And then we can go, for example, this one uh, general physical exam. And we have inside the phys uh, general physical exam, we have a little bit, a uh, little flag that has another um, task planning inside. And then we can do the whole tasks inside this um, sub process. And then we can check the general physical exam, or we can do the obstetric exam in the mother in the fetus and also we have here the risk assessment and i just want you to pay attention on that we will zoom a little bit here we have um, the overview of the the risk assessment as you can see it's also complex when we have behind all the um, task planning decision logic model behind this um, task planning. So for example, we can choose one part of the, the risk assessment for uh, pregnancy induced hypertension assessment. And we have um, the variables that we will use in a care pathway and then we have here a decision that we have to um, stabilize, stabilize each um, outcome that we can have doing this decision model. And zooming a little bit more, behind of that, we have um, the decision logic model for pregnancy. So we have all the data um, specified in archetypes and the templates, and we have um, these complex um, things behind. Here's just for you to have idea of another um, task planning, the labor and the birth overview. So we specify the full um, uh, stages of the birth and also the, the care of the newborn. And here is the postpartum 
with all the exams, examinations. We also added a little bit of the risk assessment in the postpartum with um, postpartum complications and also the newborn um, exams and phys um, physical examination. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so okay. wrapping up. So it's just it's just to just to, to um, finish. Now we have the other design that is possible to do this test planning. We've done in in draw .io, but we can do it in uh, other design. It's possible, and I, I just want to thank you, um, the Better Care uh, Company and the CKM or the Open Air Foundation to support this um, this research. Thank you. Yes. And uh, now we will switch over to, thank you very much. We'll switch over to the next part of the entire presentation or, or the program tonight. We'll switch to tools. So we'll have uh, some th different employees from the company Better that will start off showing their tools. So you can grab the screen now, whenever you're ready. And after that will be some Cambio tools and then some Dips tools. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Amatia Kejar and I'm uh, leading the development of the task planning stack at, at Better. So uh, before we jump right into the demo of the various applications and the tooling that we've developed, uh, I won't talk too much about what task planning is because uh, Thomas and others have already covered that uh, pretty well. But I did want to, of course, uh, uh explain a little bit what what the better task planning stack is so that we can understand a little bit better what uh, what we're uh, seeing what, later on when we look uh, look at the demo in short of course the task planning is uh, an attempt to do for a clinical and a medical medical administrative process what you know the open hr4 specification did for uh, for data so the ability to specify such processes using the standard uh, open EHR way, that is uh, by using uh, archetypes and templates. And of course, our own uh, task planning stack is an implementation of that specification, as well as a collection of uh, services, uh, applications, tools, and so on that uh, you can use to, uh, to model and execute and manage and uh, obviously control uh, these uh, clinical uh, processes. So the core components uh, of uh, our task planning stack are obviously the task engine, which is uh, what enforces the model, the logic and the business rules uh, that are specified uh, by the task planning specification and of course, models into the processes by, by clinical uh, modelers, as well as, of course, provide the management and querying uh, API to, to manage and uh, advance and look at, at this process. But everything, of course, starts uh, with uh, the uh, specification of plan, uh, of, of a plan to execute. And this is done using the standard tool archetype design, which has a task planning authoring mode and which can then participate in this process by, by publishing these uh, models uh, to, to the EHR server and the task planning server for, for execution. And of course, we're going to take a look uh, at that in a minute or so. And then there are the third uh, important part is the cockpit, which is uh, a UI, uh, you know, an, an administrator facing tool. Uh, which uh, through which you can execute and monitor this process and provide input data and uh, obviously uh, ensure that this process gets executed in, in the way uh, we want. So those are the three uh, most important components of, uh, of our task uh, planning stack. However, of course, uh, the task planning stack uh, doesn't, you know, live in a world of its own uh, to, to make it useful. It has to integrate and connect with uh, some external uh, services, uh, some 
you know, you know the external world, and uh, it certainly wouldn't be uh, of any use if it didn't connect at least to the EHR server to, to, to the uh, electronic health record of the patient from which it uh, uh, loads uh, clinical data, which uh, it then uses uh, to, to execute the process, which, which is needed uh, during the execution of the process, which drives essentially the execution of the process. So usually, uh, the, of course, uh, the clinical end user, the doctor, wouldn't use uh, something like the cockpit to, to execute this process, but some sort of uh, uh, specialized UI would be integrated into uh, their own uh, applications, right, where uh, they would receive tasks from, from the task planning engine and uh, then perform, perform them and, you know, uh, update uh, the process uh, in that way. Um, and of course, we have some other external systems, right, which uh, uh, also may be needed in order for us to execute the clinical process uh, successfully. Um, so what you have is maybe, you know, some demographic service that provides some information about some non-clinical information about a patient. We probably need to jump into the tools now to keep time. Yeah, okay. So this is how all the all comes together, but let's just um, take, uh, take a look at the, the tooling to, to see how this uh, all works. So some of you may be familiar with um, the archetype designer. This is essentially where you specify uh, the plans uh, that are later going to be executed in uh, the task planning engine. So this uh, is the as we authoring about, tool. Yeah, that is the authoring tool. And uh, of course, uh, it has, as we said, the task planning mode. Um, so instead of modeling just your regular open HR data, like observations, instructions, and actions, using this tool, you can actually uh, create uh, plans uh, for, for the task planning engine. And uh, uh, obviously, the instead of using uh, observations, uh, instructions, and so forth, you work with concepts defined by the task planning specifications, like your uh, condition groups, your uh, ordinary task groups, your performable tasks, and so forth. And the cool thing about this is that uh, even though you can work uh, with this tool as uh, you, you would usually when you're modeling data, the task planning mode actually has a graphical element to, to it uh, because uh, it is just easier to, to specify you know, the flow of the execution using a, a visual tool, right? And uh, obviously what you would usually do is you would, um, you would specify the flow of uh, the plan using this visual editor. And then you would, uh, then you would uh, maybe fill in some of uh, the details in, in this uh, three mode where more, more uh, information is visible <clears throat> um, than in, in the other, uh, screen so that it doesn't get cluttered. For example, uh, here is how you would specify what data to enter uh, on this particular blood pressure measurement uh, task, right? So uh, you can select the template ID and uh, the form ID that is used to enter this data into the patient CHR. And then of course the task uh, planning process uses this data to drive, to drive the process. Um, so one important thing that uh, this uh, tooling also provides is, uh, of course, uh, publishing these uh, this, uh, tools to, uh, these plans to the uh, EHR, to the clinical data repository, where it can then be used to execute the process. Uh, you have this export mode, you can validate the, the actual plan. Um, 
and if everything is okay, you would receive, you know, the notification that everything is okay, and then you can uh, publish it uh, using the publish method, and uh, the tooling will automatically connect to the EHR server to uh, publish uh, this template, which will then be made available to the task planning uh, engine for execution. So you can see that you get warnings that uh, this is already published and you want to update with a newer version. Let's not do that so that we don't um, that, that we don't uh, spoil anything. So this is how uh, the plan that we're going going to be showing actually looks like it is a plan for managing and for diagnosing and managing of hypertension so a bit of a chronic disease uh, management it consists of two task plans uh, divided by two uh, divided between two different performers the first one being the general uh, physician the gp which basically just instructs uh, the patient uh, to to undergo this treatment and then the second one is uh, for the cardiologist as we can see here where the actual testing and drug prescription and so forth uh, goes goes on and we're going to see in a minute how how all this comes together when we try to to uh, execute this process so as we said the second important tool is the cockpit which is actually the tool that allows you to um, execute uh, the process that we've modeled and i can log in as this uh, gp physician okay let's try that again and we are already in a screen where our patients uh, our patient plans are presented uh, these are obviously the uh, test runs of the of the plan that we're going to be showing for the treatment of hypertension just the test runs that i did a little bit earlier and everything starts with uh the the uh the treatment of the of the uh, the plan of the plan to, assignment of the plan to, to the patient so we have our hypertension plan we can review it briefly uh, this is how it starts then it goes into this handoff uh, so where we hand off basically the execution the performance of this plan to a different clinical specialist but uh, to actually assign it to the patient we can press this initiate button which is uh, what which takes the template the open H error template and constructs an instance a composition of this plan and places it into the patient's EHR and then the next that this is essentially a doctor prescribing this treatment this plan to to a patient uh, what follows is that we of course uh, then uh, notify the uh, task engine that uh, it can start uh, parsing and executing this this plan this process is called materialization and we've just uh, completed it and now this plan has been inserted into the patient EHR, and we can start uh, executing it so this is the cockpit which is a graph which has a graphical representation of the plan uh, we have to 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 start executing we have to assign some performer to it and we can you know just assign ourselves uh, in role as uh, the general physician which can start uh, executing this plan activation means essentially starting this plan the current task is uh, uh, basically signaled by this uh, red outline and this is also essentially it tells us where in the process we are at the, this moment so as you can see here the uh, blue color is for performable tasks those are tasks that the performer actually has to complete you know by themselves using their own hands their own knowledge and the uh, purple tasks are essentially detachable tasks which means it's, you know some sort of handoff or uh, uh, 
a hand of a disk plan to an external system is uh, or external performer is uh, conducted. So for our plan, we first have to enter some data and we can open a form and enter uh, you know, the initial blood measurement of our patient. Let's make it fairly high so that we will continue on the path that requires treatment. So as you can see, what is uh, this branch? This branching here represents a condition group. So this is a point uh, of branching in our plan, and the system, based on the data that we entered here, chose this branch where we actually need to go through through the through a consultation and treatment with a cardiologist uh, instead of maybe just you know completing some paperwork and then sending the patient home. As you can see. The, page, uh, the, the other branch has been canceled uh, by the task planning engine, and that is why it appears in this gray, uh, very visible outline. So for this uh, first performer, the general physician, this is more or less it, because right now uh, everything more interesting is then uh, done by the second performer, which is a cardiologist, which we're gonna sign shortly in uh, this more involved plan through which we're gonna go in uh, uh, the next uh, couple of minutes or so. And the only thing that we need to perform this is to assign some sort of, you know, a proper uh, performer, which is cardiologist. And you'll have in, to be fairly quick when you go through it, because we're running okay, out of time. Okay, so we're not gonna switch to the cardiologist, we're just gonna continue with, with the plan. Uh, we, our first task is to order some lab tests and we can do that by uh, performing this task and we can order some clinical blood testing. The important thing to note, to note here is that uh, the, what you're seeing on the screen right now is not part of the cockpit. This is actually better lab module, ordering the, uh, of the lab module uh, that is, uh, has been called from the cockpit application. So what you're seeing is an integration of a different application into our process. So in order to be a little bit faster, we are going to uh, remove some of these, uh, uh, obviously the doctor can, uh, can modify the order of tests. Uh, this is, uh, from previous runs, so we already have some tests ordered and this is asking us now, can we maybe reuse one of that? We're not gonna do that. And we're just gonna select uh, this plan. So this uh, uh, part of the plan has now been completed, this task has been completed, and now we are waiting for the laboratory service to, to conduct the uh, test that we ordered and uh, then we will be able to continue uh, with our plan. So we are going to now be showing, I'm going to be switching to a different, to a different uh, application, which is a laboratory simulator. I'll just log out here for a second. We log in as some sort of laboratory person and our blood, uh, order is ready to be fulfilled. The important thing to realize here is this laboratory module. This is an external performer, an external application, which is in no way connected with task planning, right? And if we return briefly back to there, we can see that this task is waiting for the notification that this external task, which in our case is uh, the laboratory uh, test uh, result uh, is uh, performed. So we can enter some of the data here to finish up our results. So I, I'm not even sure what correct values are for bilirubin and stuff like that. But let's just save this to fulfill, to fulfill our uh, order. And uh, if you were careful, uh, if you were watching carefully earlier, you would see that uh, earlier we were waiting on this task. So this task was outlined in red, but now it has automatically been completed. 
it has automatically been completed because the task planning engine has realized that the laboratory service has saved the result into the patient's EHR. So it has automatically uh, marked this uh, task as completed. You can do the same for another type of test, which is the urine test. We already have everything that we need pre-filled. So if we switch back to our laboratory module, there is our laboratory test. We can uh, just fill in a couple of things and complete. We're not gonna fill in the rest, we don't really need. And fill in this uh, order as well. So if we then return to the cockpit, you will see that now this task has also been marked as completed by and through the automatic detection of the fulfilled order of the task planning engine. And this works by using you know just normal connections between instruction between open EHR instructions and actions. So this order was an open EHR extraction. The results came with an action that uh, told us what the status of the of the order was. And because the status of the order was fulfilled, we simply close this task as completed. So we can now take another, take a measurement of uh, our patient again. Let's say that we've slightly maybe increased, uh, improved his condition so far. And now we can assess the results, the, the results of everything we did here. So this is the point of the next task. So we can maybe first look at what the current situation of our patient is, what his current uh, uh, blood pressure is like, and we can uh, take a look at uh, all those clinical uh, laboratory results that we've requested. Uh, and as you can see, this again opens the laboratory service within the cockpit. And uh, here are the results from the la from the laboratory. See, these are the same that we that we entered. Um, and uh, this is important. So, because uh, before the next step, you can see that there, we have some branching again. And uh, now we need to decide to, to decide what to do with this patient. And in order to do that, we obviously have to review the data uh, that we have. So in order to move on to the next, next uh, step, we need to complete some input on this task. And, uh, you know, the patient has a bit of a high blood pressure. So this is probably something like the first degree of high hypertension. And once we're done reviewing this order, uh, this result, uh, we can mark this step as complete. So we've now moved. Uh, this green outline now uh, signifies that we need to choose one of these branches. So this is what we we call an ad hoc uh, branch in contrast with the previous branching that we saw, which was calculated automatically by the engine based on the value of the uh, patient's uh, blood pressure. Uh, this ad hoc group is just something that the doctor chooses you know, based on his internal uh, knowledge of the situation and this current case. So let's say that we prescribe this patient a uh, single drug therapy, so we continue on this branch. So we select two branch, and we can see that, you know, the task on this branch became uh, available, whereas the other two branches were essentially thrown away. And, you uh, know, we want to prescribe some medication to lower the blood pressure of our, of our patient. We already have the order pre-filled and we can just continue on. Save the data and continue on. Now here's another important moment. Uh, obviously we, after some weeks, we need to reevaluate the situation of this patient. Uh, this would usually take about two, a week or, or two, but for this um, test, obviously, we've shortened this period for to 15 seconds. So you can imagine that the patient came back in two weeks, and we've already received notification that this event occurred and that we can now, uh, that we must now 
reevaluate the patient. So if I now refresh the plan, you can see that these tasks become available after two weeks, and we can now evaluate our patient again. And we, of course, do do so by um, measuring his blood pressure again, right? And because of that, uh, let's say that we've made some further progress and uh, let's enter the, the uh, data again. So what has happened here is that you can see that this part of the plan, essentially this part of the plan repeated once again. This happened because the parameters, the blood pressure of our patient is not within our desirable values uh, yet. So our, the blood pressure of our patient is still uh, very much high, well, no, it's still a little bit high, right? So this plan has this repetition condition so that we treat this patient by repeating this entire process of uh, testing him, prescribing him drugs, and analyzing the results until um, our uh, blood, our patient's uh, blood pressure is within uh, the desired, uh, you know, limit. So we repeat this thing again. We are not going to, of course, uh, do everything, uh, repeat everything that we've already seen, but we do actually have to have to um, enter the the uh, order at least before we can continue. Um, so let's complete this task and also these tasks again. So that we may continue with our plan. Let's see, maybe I have to refresh. And uh, we're not gonna do, go into the uh, the lab uh, application again. We're just gonna notify the, the system that this uh, lab tests have uh, been completed. You can maybe imagine that I did the same thing as I've shown before in the lab application. So just to, to shorten some time, we can notify, we can essentially simulate the completion of this uh, laboratory results by notifying this task that we are that we have received them so we measure our patient's uh, blood pressure again and we're inching closer to our desired uh, values and uh, this time uh, this time we can of course um, classify this as almost normal blood pressure already. And so let's go on. Uh, so this thing here is essentially a little mini map of, because we're in a sub plan of so the cardiology sub plan, this thing here shows you where this step is in the main plan, right? So we are executing this cardiology consultation, the sub plan of the main plan, right? Uh, just a little helper to show you um, where we are in the main plan. So we can prescribe the treatment again. Let's uh, choose this single branch again, prescribe uh, the the medication, the same one, but maybe we just need, uh, because we're improving one tablet every 24 hours. Um, again, two weeks later, the patient will come in for evaluate, after taking the patient will come in for the evaluation. And we can, uh, of course, uh, prescribe, uh, we can evaluate him again, see where his, uh, where his, uh, parameters are at this time we can maybe now register that we uh, basically brought down this is bright pressure to, to some normal levels and when we save this last task you will now receive this notification that work plan has been successfully completed 
In other words, no more repetitions of this plan of these two groups, right? Because uh, we have now essentially cured our cured our uh, patient. And if we return to his uh, to to his uh, status, we can see that he has uh, completed this uh, treatment, and we've successfully finished uh, treating this patient by by using uh, this plan. Thank you very much. This has been nice, and as we understand, this is about to deploy, to be deployed soon, and we could, I hope the audience can see the technical and the semantic things that can be done with this, and then, of course, the user interfaces can be optimized when we put this into production, I guess. So that's very nice. Uh, okay. Anything else, or can we skip over to uh, DIPS? Uh, I mean, I oh, have to come to you. Yeah, we we can move on. I have some something a little bit prepared. Uh, I think we were asked to talk about the master case a little bit, but we can skip that. If, if you can take it really quick, would be good. But uh, it took a little bit longer than planned this demo. Okay. But uh, very quick. So, so. This project is first going to be deployed or is currently being integrated into the, the city of Moscow's uh, integrated unified healthcare platform, right? So, which is already running on the battery EHR and which uh, provides, you know, a single EHR for every single uh, one of the 30 million uh, patients of, uh, of uh, Moscow. Uh, and now, of course, the uh, attempt is to do the same for uh, processes. Uh, however, the important thing to realize is there is nothing more specific in the task planning stack, and this was uh, a requirement by the customers uh, themselves. They didn't want, you know, a Moscow specific uh, task planning engine on uh, task planning stack. They wanted a standardized international, you know, open EHR uh, based uh, task planning engine. So that is what we, we made. So, in order uh, to comply with tender requirements, we had to produce these uh, 10 cases. Uh, some of them were, well, most of them were more or less not so clinically accurate, but more designed to showcase different uh, capabilities of the task planning en engine. But one, a really large, uh, very much clinically accurate uh, diabetes type 2 case uh, has been developed uh, and demonstrated to, to, to the customer. And uh, the first intended use case that they are uh, planning to have is, you know, similar to what we've shown. So uh, basically outpatient monitoring of patients with chronic diseases, uh, like diabetes, hypertension, uh, acid reflux, and so forth, right? Um, to talk about this uh, diabetes type two case, so this is really a huge plan, which consists of about 12 different subplans. So we've seen uh, this one that we've demonstrated, you had two fairly short ones, but uh, the actual uh, uh, diabetes two one has um, really, you know, 12 uh, different task plans uh, and took quite a while to put all that together. It took about three months for the committee to, to basically sign off on every task on every branch uh, in the uh, plan. Uh, and of course, uh, the plan is, uh, is monitoring and treating the patient for the duration of his life. You know, the diabetes can't really be cured. So uh, the plan repeats, like we've seen um, uh, in the demo, every three months. But you said it took some time to do this. Was that to get agreement among the clinicians that took time, or was it the technical modeling? No, it wasn't so much the technical, although there was some inclusion because this task uh, planning stack was fairly immature. That uh, time, but it was mostly to have the clinical experts all agree on on, on everything uh, that needs to go into this yes. plan. So that was the main reason for why it took three three months. I think that uh, you know, with the current knowledge, we would probably do this in something like ten days to 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 two weeks, maybe, to to model a plan of of such proportion. And so this is a part of uh, the uh, plan that you, that you can see. This is just one of the actual 20 um, 
to uh, or sorry, twelve uh, sub plans that we uh, used in Moscow. And, and is, it, uh, is it possible to put links to those uh, in the agenda? Yes, but you will uh, have to realize that this is all in Russian. So, <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, there's really can't be on on the slide. But yes, absolutely, this is available to 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 for everyone to see. And uh, I guess that that is uh, it from me. So thank you very much. It's, uh, I think that Bushkan still had. Some, uh, uh, they've said in the chat here that they skip the boss jam part because they wanted to give you some extra time. So then we'll okay. change over to Cambio CDS tools and after that some DIPS tools. And we'll have to be fairly quick. And here comes Ron. We don't hear you. Are you muted, Ron? Uh, we do not. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Um, yes. How many minutes, I'm asking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep it as short as you can, uh, between five and ten. Or okay. Ra ra rather five, actually, if we're going to. Yeah, but that's through. impossible. I mean, I mean, for, for the Swedish audience, actually, it's important to know uh, if you if, if you can be customers, I mean, there's a much longer, like, I think it was like two, three hours recorded the product demo. Uh, and, and please get in touch with us. You know, we have ongoing projects with uh, the whole KGC group. Um, but then the short version is now, I mean, this is the main modeling tool we call this uh, GDO2 editor. Uh, and that's actually the main modeling tools for all GDO guidelines. Uh, all of the GDO guidelines, we treat them as a reusable module. And this one is about the body surface area. You can actually do a quite a lot with this, uh, this editor. Um, so the definition part, and, and actually there's um, quite extensive tutorials uh, on the, on the on the website, it's publicly available, public available for uh, for students and, and for anyone interested in this type of modeling. And we also publish uh, GDO2 guidelines as open source software. Uh, there are more than 200 of them in both Swedish and English language uh, in different kind of areas. Um, so back to the editor, I mean, you can do modeling, you can do terminology bindings, you can add translations, you can add uh, different Swedish uh, English labels. Uh, you can also do test. Um, for instance, uh, you can put some weight and height. You can calculate the result, and then you can repeat uh, the, t the test in this kind of uh, built-in uh, testing uh, so, uh, support. So it's quite uh, all-in-one environment for single guideline. Um, so this is the repository. Uh, I think it's, it's linked in the agenda. You can find the links there. Uh, here's another tool for us to organize a bit more, you know, around the community open source projects. Um, this is directly connected to, the, to this repo in the GitHub, and it has different visualization for guidelines and so on. Uh, we also have uh, a way to publish guidelines directly as a single page application, you know, essentially for just educational purpose. So we can actually run this, uh, this kind of single, single page calculator, uh, single model calculator. And this is actually how we run the app challenge that we're doing for the third year now. We just closed uh, this year with the students. And we also use this kind of environment to support informatics uh, and medical students in the, uh, in the Stockholm area uh, with lectures and so on. Uh, so here's the tutorial. Uh, again, you will find that in the agenda. Uh, this is the portal you have seen in the previous demo. Uh, we use this to regulate access and uh, for demoing purpose, but also troubleshooting and so on. Uh, so it's very easy to go into this kind of tools uh, to try different versions, even sometimes the language and uh, schemes, uh, we call these themes. Um, you can run this app directly in the portal. Uh, you can actually exercise and run these uh, guidelines uh, as if you, know, you have this as embedded. Uh, the last part is actually about the tools that we use um, in our own development. Uh, so we develop this uh, plugin for IntelliJ, something called the CDS Studio. Uh, it's a new authoring environment. And the purpose is to provide all in one environment for testing, for interacting with the, the alert application you are working with. So this particular one is called Warframe Syndrome Alert. 
essentially is about detecting a very rare condition uh, with young patient below 10 years old, uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, optic atrophy, and so on. Um, so I will run this now inside uh, the studio. Once it's up, um, I can send uh, input data like this one, uh, patient condition into this, uh, into this particular format is uh, fire-based, but uh, of course we, we're working with this now. Um, this is based on CDS hooks, uh, one of the way to connect remote CDS service to any clinical system. Uh, so we use this standard as the way to, to implement these kind of simple alerts uh, for different kind of EHR situation. So as you can see, the result is here. So it's a CDS hooks card, card. Uh, it's a single card return. And for more complica complicated case, we can actually return uh, a link, uh, including an interactive app. Um, that's another one for single screen application. So this one is already running. I just move it up here. So it's uh, less polished, as you can see, uh, different kind of labels still to be figured out. But uh, the model behind, the main model is actually the Tmax. It's, uh, you know, if you're in emergency care, it's similar to the heart score. So it's for rapid rule out of uh, coronary syndrome. Um, so there are lots of input. Sometimes, sometimes can be pre-filled, sometimes can be uh, um, entered by user. Then this is the lab test, high sensitivity troponin. So you interpret the probability of ACS and uh, the risk of um, uh, ACS um, ma major cardiac event in 30 days. And then the recommended uh, you know, uh, treatment and follow up. And this is an interactive app. Uh, and then as I said, you can combine this with alerts make uh, the usability even better. And of course you can t do testing. You can, uh, this is the UI part. Uh, there's a simple decoratory, decoratory language that you can de design the layout, the placement of the widgets. We have a UI library. Our intention is that uh, we engage our customers so they can build tools, uh, simple application alerts by themselves and then they can plug this into Take Care and Cosmic or even certain applications by using standards like Open EHR and FIRE. So that's essentially what we do. And there are lots of material that we can provide. Uh, if you're already a customer, they're much longer extended recorded video. Um, but if you're interested in the informatics part, there's a lot of openly available material regarding GDL, regarding the models. And that will be it. Eric. That was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> very good presentation. Uh, can we do a little quick dips tour also, Bjorn, or what's the plan? It won't be quick. I think I will use maybe two hours now. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, um, I will try to do things uh, quick and maybe just show uh, something. Uh, because you asked about the tooling, uh, Eric, to say something about it. So I will give a few minutes, uh, the two minutes there. And then I will do, talk a bit about task planning, but uh, not much, just to get an idea. So uh, very quick then, this uh, Morten uh, a while ago uh, presented this acute award uh, uh, form. Uh, what we're looking into now is the development environment we use to create forms. Uh, um, the, the, the award uh, form was very complex. So if you just look into a more simple one like this, then uh, on the right side here, we can go into the um, the form. So this is to go behind the scenes. What do we have here? And to look for the calculations, we can see that uh, here we have uh, a, a plus B plus C plus D. So all the variables in this uh, scoring is, uh, is mapped up to that. So, and we can do different kind of calculations. That's it. Um, to make the forms, we use uh, a form designer. So we have uh, cooperated with uh, Better. Uh, so we, we share more or less uh, the same uh, form definitions. So this is our form designer. Maran has, uh, sorry, uh, the Better has uh, the same kind of functionality. On the left side, you have the template. You can drag it in. You can do the visual layout and so on and uh, do dependencies. So, and this we could talk for, for hours. We just, I will just go into this uh, thing about uh, task planning. This will be very jumpy, uh, but uh, anyway. Uh, 
just um, I'm very impressed about uh, the, what you have done uh, better, what you uh, demonstrated and the complexity in the, uh, in the solution is, is really good. What we have been looking into is how can we actually uh, integrate task planning into the, the existing EHR. So just to give an example, we have not implemented the task planning in, in the system now, but we have kind of did a pre-implementation of something. So given this uh, patient, Olga Lungisik, she is, uh, um, has a disease. This was the um, acute uh, page that Morten showed you, but she is going for surgery. And as part of the surgery, uh, you have this kind of protocol where you call, call for the patient and you uh, take her, her into the pre-room. Uh, pre and then you have into the ward and anesthesia start. And what you will see here is that different tasks appear. So uh, depending on the protocol for the surgery and, uh, and when you then start surgery, you will see that this surgery protocol is, uh, is opened. So this is a way to kind of integrate uh, task planning into the, the running system. And this is more or less what we are looking for uh, when it comes to uh, task planning uh, in DIPS is on the more over, you know, the, the overview uh, things. So we have published this, it's available on uh, GitHub as an examples on task planning. This is uh, outpatient uh, uh, consultation uh, for the, the patient going to hip replacement. Uh, so, so we are working on this, this uh, side to have more kind of ad hoc plans, but to, to, to combine the, the patient flow, the patient trajectories and make the, the overall plan visible and what to do next in a distributed uh, environment. Well, that, that was very short, but uh, I will keep it there. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess you will provide links in the agenda also if we want to have a closer look at that. Yeah. Okay, so that was a very <laughs> quick wrap up of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll do, we'll skip the combinations part. As you can understand, single screen apps and these more long time flows can be combined. And as you saw, you can jump into a screen or a form from such a long multi stakeholder thing. So you'll just have to believe us in that and we'll jump over to a picture about the future roadmap from Thomas Beale here before we go into the question session. Oh, we're what, super, what, super fast. And, well, and when he's doing that, I will just remind you that uh, there is the forum where you can ask questions. Some questions have been added there from the other chats and we can try to answer them. Uh, afterwards if we run out of time. Okay, so a very tiny um, pointer to what the roadmap of the future of the, all of this looks like, especially answering, I suspect, a common question of, of well, okay, why, why isn't GDL and task planning one thing? So the history of uh, specification and implementation started with guidelines, so uh, GDL, there's actually something called GDL2 already. GDL3 is the future. Um, and you know, as you can imagine, the guy's doing that primarily in Cambio and now it's branching out to all, all parts of the community using it, have a lot of ideas in the pipeline. You've understood that there's a plan um, thing, which is to do with tasks and a sort of a structured plan concept. So that's the task planning. Uh, the tricky things to get right in all of these environments uh, connecting that to the data and then to the back end system so that you can mention things like heart rhythm or heart rate inside your decision logic and maybe in your task plan and so on. So a lot of the questions about the future are actually to do with the integration points and solving all that in a way that the separate bits are reusable but also connectable. Then just to say, okay, well, you've seen a lot of applications and it's obviously critical to make all this stuff work for applications. So there's ways of connecting to applications and you've seen quite a lot of stuff uh, this afternoon and uh, CDS hooks is one of the major ways and that's the primary or uh, not the primary but at least one of the primary possibilities that GDL uses uh, and so th the areas that we'll be concentrating on are essentially that and those gold arrows and just uh, making sure that we do have a future um, 
uh, both at specification level and ultimately eventually in the implementations such that GDL and or what GDL becomes and task planning are in fact part of the same larger formal architecture and you know reusable decision logic modules and so on. So hopefully that's a, that, that just gives a little bit of an idea of where we're heading. So we are certainly heading for integration of all of this stuff. Um, as you might imagine, it takes time for companies to do a bit of experimenting and try things and you know that's how we learn. Eric? Yes, uh, and I guess this is one of the main learning ways in OpenHR that we don't want to sit and invent things at the desks. We want to try them for real and then we need to get together and figure out how to standardize it. Is that correct? Absolutely. So it's a, it's a rolling process of uh, pulling in um, results. Uh, I mean, you know, open air generally has been the last 10 years plus or maybe even 12 years of implementation. And that's actually driving most of the specification uh, work for the, quite, at least five to six years now. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, right now we're at the end of time that was appointed. So those that need to leave, we understand if you need to do that. Uh, we have the meeting is set up for another 15 minutes until it closes and dies. Uh, so those that have time can stay for some questions that we'll take from, that we've gotten from the audience already. So there was one question about the overlap between the GDL and, and uh, the task planning parts and how is that going to be solved? And I guess you touched on it here pretty well that we're redesigning different parts or sharing parts or what's happening. Yeah, I mean, the, the simple answer is we, we, I mean, we're still working on this, but uh, the simplest way to understand it is having a single way of representing decision logic uh, or CDS logic guideline logic that uh, works for little fragments of decisions because what you find in task plans is little, you know, just a simple decision and then you move on to some more tasks and then you have another decision. Whereas the GDL sort of picture of the world looks more like a lot of decision logic. Uh, so we need to unite that and that's one of the things that we're actively working on between the task planning and guideline of the GDL group. Yeah, I think there's another thing about the scalability. I mean, uh, I mean as one of the comment on the forum, it points out, you know, how can how can you reuse task plans uh, across different areas? I mean, one way to do that is modular modularize decision making steps, make it smaller. And and in our experience, when we work with applications in different market in Denmark, UK, and Sweden, there are lots of common algorithms, uh, common protocols that we can reuse across uh, different decision making applications. Yeah, I think, I mean, the few, that's, in a way, that's why that picture I put there has got this, it just says decision logic module. I mean, mm. it's not a formal name, but the idea is certainly, I mean, you, you've kind of done it really nicely in, in GDL. Uh, and I think we need to, you know, there'll be a next version that fixes a few little things in that. And eventually um, it'll be, uh, it will be a library of lots of little pieces, even a single line function that, that says where, how you determine whether somebody is, uh, in tachycardia or atrial fibrillation or something else. And, you know, it might have five lines of code in it, but it's still something that's been worked out that contains criteria that have been clinically uh, determined. So I think we're heading for libraries of little pieces that we can build up into larger plans and CDS algorithms and so on. There was one question about, uh, I think it's directed to wrong partly, if uh, these things that you demoed can they, if they've been integrated to take, take care, can they be integrated to Cerner and Cosmic, etc.? cetera? Um, we have experience actually integrating some of the apps we take care. Um, we have, of course, you know, all the, all of the apps that we develop, they're also for the Swedish clients using uh, Cosmic. So that's definitely is. Cerner, we haven't had any, uh, you know, real life experience. Uh, but my understanding is that they're using APIs uh, as well, you know, Fire and CDS hooks and so on. So there's a high likelihood it's going to work with them as well. Yes. Uh, and then there's a question here also regarding the Brazil maternity models, if uh, they are available, could anyone 
build the maternity system off the back of them. So, for example, could we pull them into uh, the things shown by Better here, for example, for the Moscow region? I think Danny may have disappeared off the panelists, which I think means she can't say anything. But uh, the intention is that, I mean, they she will publish them openly and they'll be um, probably rebuilt inside the Better Archetype Designer uh, so it's it's just a matter of time, but they're not some some secret thing. Um, so yes, they will appear publicly at some point. Yes, and then there are also some uh, questions regarding digital twins and uh, how to. Let's see if we can find the questions here. Uh, it's uh, partly about. Digital twins and how can you get patient data such as from wearable sensors, health monitoring devices, etc., into clinical decision support systems? And I thought I'll see if I can share a little picture what we're experimenting with in Region Östergötland as an answer to that. Uh, let's see here. So what you see here is uh, uh, <clears throat> we've found out that, well, the mobile phones are already there. You can connect them to Google Fit or Apple Health is already included. So it wasn't that very hard. We put some students to work and in a couple of months part time, they made a web application that could pull the data out of Google Fit and then get them into our digitalization platform where we have an open EHR or we're procuring one, but we had one for test an open air backend and we could also connect to Cambio and all these other things. Uh, and that was fairly easy. One has to remember that, for example, Google Fit, if you get a blood pressure, it doesn't tell you if the person was sitting or standing or lying down when we took the pressure. So in the application, you also have to enrich the data if it's going to be used inside an electronic health record. So maybe the patient can say, I always do them sitting. And then we add that to the data when you pull it in. And then the idea behind this is that, well, you can take your data from whatever source it is, if it's Google or Apple, and then you can sort it or aggregate it and say, well, to the healthcare, I only want to say the average number of steps per week or whatever, not exactly when I've been moving every hour. So I send an average there, but maybe all the details I want to send to my own little personal health record, but that could also be based on OpenHR. And then we're working together with some researchers doing digital twin work where you have a model of the human being, so to speak, so that you can tweak and use the data. So the point is that you should have one private twin that you can run on your own data uh, and maybe me be more detailed. And there could be another copy of the twin that runs on the caregiver's data and whatever you have chosen to share with the healthcare. So that's just a, a short answer to those things are possible. And if you want to look at this stuff, it's on GitHub. And I believe Better also has a lot of integration stuff with uh, Apple and those things, right? Someone from Better could answer that. I think you've integrated stuff from, uh, from uh, Apple Health. Yeah, so yeah. the... Uh, okay, you, you go, Christian. Sorry, I didn't know you were yes, online. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, we have... Uh... Uh, we have integrated very well with uh, with uh, uh, with iPhones, basically. Uh, but we were more working on the side of you know getting the getting the thing measured. So basically, connecting the phone with the various uh, kind of consumer grade uh, medical devices you can attach and uh, and measure stuff in. The integration part was actually super easy. So put that into the platform was was really easy. Yes. Yes. Does anyone else uh, that have been watching the stream of questions have something that you want to lift to the audience while we're still online? Let's see. There was one other question on discourse, and I can't remember what it was. Yes, and we have some here. And then there, there's a really big question that we got from the application form uh, regarding the diagnostic process. This is uh, <laughs> maybe dangerous to open here. When it comes to problem-oriented data records, shouldn't that be 
the best thing for diagnosis support, etc. But how do you actually design such a system? Can you make a problem-based record? That's a very uh, big question. You so, want me to do that one quickly, Eric? Yep. It's, it's, it's very easy and very hard. It's very easy to, the data models are all done. Um, we know how to do them. The big problem with POMR is A, it's a lot of work. I used to do them in my own practice when I was a GP and it's hard work. And the other is that you need, people need to actively curate them. And then you're, getting, you're into a governance process, which now that can work quite well within a single GP practice. But if you try to extend that to a hospital environment or even to a national environment, there's a big, big question there about how you actually manage that. Um, because it's problems in diagnosis are very contextual uh, and people see them in slightly different ways depending on the job they do. So I know that in, in Scotland, where they've got a, a national policy to use open EHR, they want to use problem oriented records but they recognize that this is going to take some time because it's mostly a, a clinical problem rather than a technical one mm. yes okay uh, and you can keep asking questions in the online form because that will survive even after we close this session uh, and does anyone from the SEC want to lift anything else or comment anything from the other things you've seen? There was a question about uh, CE and medical device directives. I know that, um, Rom, you have a lot of experience with that. You might just... Uh, yeah, thanks, yeah. I was just writing half sent sentence. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, for, for, yeah, to answer the question, there is, uh, I think it's quite straightforward. We see, Mark, uh, all for products, uh, you know, based GDO-based products. Uh, so that's a clear answer. But then when it comes to customers uh, or any other guys using GDO editors and so on, I mean, it's, in, it's really just up to them how they certify, how they actually uh, run their own development. Uh, just like, you know, someone invented Java programming language and provide tools, you know, the tools doesn't really necessarily certify, certify the programs, the, the, the outputs of the programming language. So we just provide the tool sets and a set of specification, essentially. Yes. yes, and hospitals are allowed to do make some products of their own, but then they have all the same requirements as a CE marking, mm. the same quality requ requirements, even though we don't have to go through the CE marking ourselves. Mm. But then we also need to take full responsibility and have yeah. quality measures. So that, that's a big question in many regions. Mm. We need to learn that stuff. Okay. There was one other question, and maybe again, it might be wrong, it's best place to, it's uh, interested to hear how you describe the difference between Smart on Fire and Open EHR CDS apps. Um, I mean, this notion of CDS, uh, CDS uh, Open EHR CDS apps uh, is kind of loosely defined. I mean, of course, we do single screen application. Uh, and a lot of that is based on or inspired by smart apps. This is essentially, you know, this kind of application. Um, but we we kind of tune down the, the fire part. You know, we, we choose to support uh, any kind of standards. But a lot of the things are kind of baking to this design. It's uh, hooked up with uh, uh, the CDS hooks links. And then we also use uh, security token. You know, we use uh, all this kind of well thought design. Um, so in, in a sense, you know, you can say the apps we're developing, they're also, you know, a smart app compliant, mm -hmm. um, but but without maybe the, the fire and, and the HO7 uh, part. Yeah, it's, it's got, there's quite a few of us have developed smart or smart on fire apps mm -hmm. over the top of, of um, open air CDRs, that's the data repositories, not the CDS aspect. It's not particularly hard uh, mm -hmm. because you've got good access to the data underneath putting a little interface in there is I actually had some students working on that so it's not a it's not a challenge okay thank you everybody we I believe we need to stop now before the recording mm -hmm. and everything stops here and we'll go on uh, online in the text forums uh, where you can keep asking questions and also please those of you that are reading have a look around at existing questions and uh, there are many different threads and different categories where you can look for different things and there are also some in the open ehr.se things where we can discuss things and have a look at the COVID stuff also if you're interested in that. So thank you very much everyone who has 
in speaking and attending. Bye bye. Thanks to our audience. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.